Sahar was a young girl from a remote Afghan village. Sold into slavery as a child bride, she was forced to live with her husband and in-laws. When she lived with her husband and in-laws, they wanted her to prostitute. Because she refused, they tortured her. They beat her. They burned her body with hot metal rods. They chained her to the basement of their home and starved her for months on end. At one point, she managed to escape to a neighbor's house. However, instead of protecting her, they dragged her back to her husband's house, and she was tortured even worse. Now, initially, her uncle, thankfully, found her and rescued her from this situation. When he found her, her body was so damaged that she couldn't sit, she couldn't lay down straight and had to sleep sitting upright. And she had to get help with walking and eating for months. Now, at first, the in-laws were charged and convicted for having tortured, torturing Sahar. However, once the media frenzy died down, they were quietly released. The judges and the prosecutors that were involved in this case did an abysmal job of protecting Sahar from her 34-year-old husband. She was 12. In 2008, I went to Afghanistan. And I went there initially because I received an opportunity to train and mentor Afghan defense attorneys. And within my first year there, I went around the country and I talked to hundreds of people that were locked up throughout the country in prisons. I also talked to many businesses that were operating in Afghanistan. And in these conversations, I started hearing the connections about how the laws that were meant to protect them were being underused, while unwritten corrupt punitive measures were overused. And so in 2009, I decided to open a private practice in Afghanistan, and I became the first foreigner to litigate in the Afghan courts. Initially, I knew that the law needed to be looked at differently. And so like a musical servant sees music, that's how I started seeing laws. And I realized that it was time for me to update and reshuffle my playlist on how I looked at and used laws. And so this put me on a quest for justness. And what justness means to me is using laws for their intended purpose, which is to protect. The role of laws is to protect. And so, as I continued to study the laws and saw cases and met people from around the world and read up on various jurisdictions, I realized that the lack of justice is not just an Afghanistan problem, but it's a global problem. And while I initially opened my practice for the purposes of representing private companies and also private individuals for criminal matters, I found that the need for justice was too great and I began also representing human rights clients like Sahar. And then I became a global investor in human rights. Now, the method to my madness is very simple. What I do is I use the laws, often unused laws, and I work them for the benefit of my clients, and I work the system from the inside out. I also try to encourage businesses as well as people to also become global investors in human rights. For myself, as a private international litigator, I represent many people across the globe on pro bono human rights cases, and I'm completely self-funded. And that's how I choose to invest in human rights. For businesses, I try to encourage them to civilize the economy by, at the very least, developing international standards that are consistent with international human rights standards. For people, I try to encourage people to educate themselves on the law because I have found by and large that people are very uneducated as to what their rights are and also to what the laws are. By using the laws intelligently and effectively, we can try to work together to build confidence back into rule of law and by doing so we can hold those accountable who violate the law. So let's get back to Sahar. When I met with Sahar, it was very difficult to meet such a young woman so broken. Well, we talked about her case, and we talked about her legal options. And after we sat and discussed it, she decided that she wanted me to represent her as her lawyer. And this is extremely significant because this is the first time that a person in Afghanistan that's a victim 
was being represented by a lawyer on a criminal matter, a law that's been on the books for years and years but has never been used until Sahar. In addition to this, we decided to petition to the Supreme Court to get those that tortured her. Again, using the laws that were on the books for years that had never been used, um, we used with Sahar's case. And then in addition to that, we also sued for civil compensatory damages. Again, traveling uncharted legal territory. And so we went to the Supreme Court together, and there we were, me as an American lawyer, and Sahar, a young woman who when I first met her was too timid to look me in my eye. We stood up in front of 12 Supreme Court justices, and after hours of pleading our case, they agreed with what we were presenting to them, and it was beautiful to watch. Unanimously, the judges agreed that the in-laws should be prosecuted for what they had done to Sahar. They also agreed that her husband and brother should also be prosecuted for torturing her and having sold her. Justness prevailed. According to UNICEF, there are currently 700 million females who are currently child brides or have once been child brides. Child marriages prolong the vicious cycle of lack of education, poverty, and poor health. Protecting Sahar protects us. According to the UN General Assembly a couple months ago, they reported that over one in three women on the globe right now is or has been a victim of physical violence. A few months ago, a 27-year-old woman named Fercunda was standing up for her sick friend. Her sick friend went to purchase an amulet from a man for the purposes of trying to get better. It didn't work. So Furkunda decided that she would stick up for her friend and go and approach this man with the intention of trying to get her friend's money back. When she went and approached this man, instead of dealing with the issue, he then immediately falsely accused her of burning the Holy Quran. She, of course, had not done this, but it didn't matter. Onlookers that are around this guy blindly jumped on his bandwagon and also began accusing Furkunda of burning the Holy Quran. At the end of it all, they beat her, they ran her body over with a car, and they burned her. They murdered her. Now, this particular situation was videotaped by dozens of people. It showed hundreds, hundreds of people sat back and watched as Furkunda was murdered and did nothing. Many of the people that were there were police officers who also failed to protect Furkunda. Now, this case shocked Afghanistan. It shocked the world. And I represent Furkunda's family. And part of what we wanted to do is obviously, of course, hold those accountable who were directly involved in murdering her. But also, what was also important was to hold those accountable who failed to render assistance to her, particularly the police officers. Now, the trial was not perfect, and it had its flaws. However, a few weeks ago, we did get a verdict. And the courts found that 12 civilians were found guilty for being directly involved in murdering Furkunda. And 11 police officers were also convicted for being involved in their failure to render assistance to Furkunda. Now, this is extremely significant, and it's significant because Afghanistan is a very rural country. And it's a country where it shows that the community has a responsibility to its people. And so these sentences and these convictions are very unprecedented. Mob violence is not just a problem in Afghanistan. This is a global problem. Too often, we have seen mobs erupt where people are videotaping it and no one is rendering assistance with little or no consequences are being imposed. Ironically, Afghanistan, by imposing these sentences on those that were directly involved, and also by imposing these sentences on the police officers for their, their failure to act, they've become a global front runner in showing the world that we all have a responsibility to do something if we so see someone gets hurt. And in this case, it was the police officers. 
So it doesn't matter where, whether a mob happens in Afghanistan or Texas, we have a responsibility to each other. Protecting Furkunda protects us. Now, with my job, there's a certain amount of risks that are involved, both personally as well as professionally. But I find that it's a far greater risk if I sit back and I watch my clients being taken advantage of by the laws. I don't know if you've heard this theory, but there, there was this theory back in the day of six degrees of separation where we're all connected to each other by six people. Well, according to scientists at the University of Milan and Facebook, apparently Facebook has scientists now, <laughs> we are now 4.74 degrees of separation from each other. And so what were once individual problems are now problems for all of us. And our global dysfunctional family is getting smaller and we're getting more and more connected to each other. It's my goal to raise the global bar of legal representation because I understand that rule of law means absolutely nothing if there's no role of law. According to the national studies on missing children, there are currently 800,000 children that are missing. UNICEF has reported that 300,000 children are currently missing and are being used in armed conflicts. Nikki had three sons, ages two months, three years, and five years old in the UK. Unfortunately, her sons were kidnapped by a family member. She went to the British police to try to get their help and they couldn't do anything. She then sought the help of a UK barrister who tried to do things but couldn't do anything as well. And so Nikki reached out to me for the purposes of trying to find her boys and to bring them back to her. There was a strong reason to believe that the kids were in Afghanistan, but we had no idea where they were. Sometimes what I do is when laws don't exist, I try to create systems. And I try to create systems that make sense, that if there were, was a law, it would be consistent with that. So Afghanistan, unfortunately, is not a signatory to the International Convention on Child Abduction. So what that means is, is that Afghanistan has no obligation or duty to assist on such cases. So we created a system. And so I was able to get legal guardianship of the kids in the UK courts. I then was able to get that legalized in Afghanistan and approved through the Afghan courts. This then allowed for me to lobby to the Afghan police as well as to the international British police to work with me in trying to find the boys. So with our strong triangular effort, we work collaboratively together. And I'm happy to say that we were able to find the boys after they had been missing for almost two years. We worked five months on the case. And where precedent is very scarce on international child abductions, this case serves as a blueprint that can be used and translated to help others in different countries. And I'm proud to say that I had the pleasure of taking the boys back to Nikki a few months ago. Now these cases, they're not just simple problems. And they're not just individual problems, but they represent larger global issues. Domestic violence, modern day slavery, mob violence, and kidnapping. These cases are all precedent-setting blueprints that can be used to help with translate to other countries, to help other countries, other cases, and other people. And while anomalies, these cases represent the possibilities of what you can do when you use the laws. They show that even in a country like Afghanistan, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, that if you use the laws the way that they're intended to be used, then our voices cannot be denied. The law is our instrument. It's our voice. And it's time that we all update, reshuffle, and fine-tune our playlist and understand that the law is meant to be there because protecting one protects all of us. Lawyers, we also need to step up our game. We need to bring honor back to this profession. And we need to understand that lawyers need to stop talking in that legalese, newspeak, bullshit language that you talk to your clients when you're explaining to the law, about the law, and you need to talk about the law in a language that everyone can understand. Businesses also need to get with the program. 
A corporate investment in human rights is a capital gain on your businesses. Instability of the laws perpetuates the inability of emerging markets to participate in a global economy. And businesses need to work together towards civilizing the economy and understand that the economy is meant to serve the good of the people and it's not the other way around. As individuals, we have a responsibility to educate ourselves on what our rights are and also on what the law is. And for those that cannot educate themselves on the law, we have a responsibility to educate them. And I'm not telling you what I think, I'm telling you what I know. And I'm not gonna stop fighting. And I need you guys to fight with me. I'm a global investor in human rights, and you should be a global investor in human rights. By working collectively in the public, private, and people sector, we can bring our leverage and point out government deficiencies and find those accountable who abuse their power. We need to work together to bring confidence back to rule of law. By doing this, we empower people like Sahar, Nikki, her boys, Furkunda, and so many others, and create a collective environment of achieving to living and inspiring to live in truth, and we create an environment where we try to strive for justice for all. Thank you.